In this trio of videos, we're going to look at a strategy for being able to evaluate and critique designs that is extremely powerful and cost effective. The strategy is called heuristic evaluation or heuristic based feedback. And what I like about this is that there's, of course, lots of ways to evaluate user interface designs. You can evaluate them empirically. You can use formal models. You can have automated software measures. And what we're going to talk about here is being able to use expertise and heuristic feedback to be able to critique designs. One reason that I like heuristic evaluation so much is that you can use these heuristics to talk about designs throughout the entire design process. So you don't need to wait until you've built software. You can do this very early on with a paper prototype. Um, as you're starting to build things, you can give these heuristics to users so they have the vocabulary to talk about what's effective. You can give it to your manager. Everybody on the design team can use these heuristics. You can also use these before redesigning. So after you've released software and you're thinking about making a new version, heuristic evaluation is great as a way of going through the post-mortem of what you might want to do next. These heuristics were originally developed by Jacob Nielsen uh, around 1990. And what they've been used most commonly for is you get a couple of people together who walk through a user interface, and they look for instances of design that violate the 10 heuristics we'll walk through in these sections. Then you can get together, sync up about what you found, and decide which are the most important to go forward with from there. The 10 heuristics that we're going to look at in these videos cover a wide swath of different user interface features, and I think will give you a useful vocabulary. The last thing to say before we dive in is that there's nothing magic in particular about this set of 10. Uh, I've revised them based on uh, my own experience from the original ones that Jacob Nielsen came up with. And if you have a different kind of software than the kind of things that Jacob or I had in mind, you can add, remove, or change these heuristics to suit your needs. Uh, but here is a launching point for being able to do effective user interface critique are 10 heuristics for good design. We'll cover them in three groups, helping users understand your interface, helping users act, and providing feedback about what the system's done. Let's look at how you can make your interface more understandable. We build our mental representations and expectations based on experience. And for that reason, it's important to be consistent, both within your software and with similar software that other users may have experience with. Here's an example of something that violates the consistency principle. With this version of Microsoft Visual Basic, there were four different places that you could put the dialog box buttons. And there's no good reason for that. Sometimes, of course, you will break consistency. But here, it's just sloppy. In this Verizon customer service page, the names that were used as part of contacting customer service were probably names of the business units. But that wasn't any of the user-facing language that was elsewhere on the site. And so it's difficult to know if you'd like to get your USB data modem serviced, whether you are part of mobile web or national access, for example. Here's an example from the Adobe license repair utility. You see here at the bottom, I blacked out a little bit of the interface. And what do you think is there? Well, normally you would think it means continue. But in fact, here it says, do you wish to cancel? The first time I ran this, I clicked yes to continue before having fully read this. And of course, it exited me out, and I had to start over. Here's a wonderful example of using consistency and offering clarity that in this dialog box, it asks you a question. And then the buttons, as opposed to being yes, no, which might be hard to map, use the same terms that we see up at the top of the dialog box. This brings us to our second heuristic of using familiar metaphors and language. Here's a really great example from the Adobe Acrobat uh, print dialog box. It uses the metaphor of a world in miniature. The graphical user face, in general, draws its power through its analogy to the physical world. In this print dialog box, we see a world in miniature of the page that we're about to print. That page happens to be legal-sized, but we have letter-sized paper set. We're alerted to that by the fact that we get the grayed-out area along the bottom. 
Some other familiar metaphors that you can use are the desktop, folders, a shopping cart. These are all things that we're familiar with in the physical world and also what they mean in the digital world. And if you're designing for a particular user group, speak their language. This is a nice example of a web page for kids where the language is very kid-friendly. This is a fun example that I came across when getting a visa to travel to India. The visa web application lists more than 50 states in the US, and it distinguishes in particular Southern California and Northern California. Now, I've lived in both places, and I can say that many Californians do wish that the state were separated. Currently, it's a single state, and many of us are sure which part we live in, but it is unexpected. And I can imagine if you live in between, you wouldn't know which one to select. Nor should you need to. In fact, in many cases, a state drop-down should be obviated by the zip code. And that kind of streamlining is our next heuristic, to have clean, functional design. Le Corbusier famously said that form follows function. So your layout should be driven by what people would like to do. Uh, this is an example of the Weather Channel from 2012, where I mean, the reason you go to get the weather for San Francisco is because you want to know the weather for San Francisco. None of that is above the fold. All of the things that you actually need are below the fold if you get there. Here's an amazing example, which is so remarkable, it's so bad, that I, I think it's, it's, it's actually pretty good, but probably not quite what you want. This is a car rental place where uh, there's all sorts of crazy going on. This is an extreme example, of course, but if you're not careful, there can be a lot of different things going on, and users won't be able to focus on what they care about. A more mundane example of not dealing with the signal-to-noise ratio is this Google form I encountered in 2010. Uh, here, there's a lot of these old web um, boxes around all of the cells. Of course, all, that's all chart junk. You know, you, what you really want to see is the content of the form itself get rid of those extra lines. And lastly, it can be a really strong impulse in organizations to be able to add value to whatever you're doing. Sometimes that takes away from the core user needs. For example, on this student loan website, what you want to be able to do is find your loan balance, pay your loan, make sure your address is up to date, all of that kind of stuff. Somebody thought it'd be a good idea to add widgets. But nobody spends that much time on their student loan website, and what kind of widget would you add anyhow? So this wraps up our heuristics on helping users understand your interface. The next session will cover heuristics related to action.